Welcome to Grace Bible Fellowship. Uh, for those of you viewing online and those of you who are new here, uh, this is a little different because we teach the Bible here, line by line. We try to understand what it is that God speaks to us. I'm not going to talk to you about politics. <laughs> Nobody needs depression this early in a Sunday morning. I'm not going to talk to you about Russia and the Ukraine. I'm not going to talk to you about many other things that the rest of the world talks about. What we're going to do is we're going to try to hone in on what God wants to teach us through his word. Amen? Amen. And so let's do that first by praying his blessing on our meeting. Father, thank you so much for the worship that we were able to proclaim that there's nothing better than you. And it is true. And I pray that you help us, Lord, as our good father, as the shepherd of our souls, that you would lead us through your word, that you might help us to see you and to see ourselves, that we might come more into alignment in our lives where we would be like you. Lord God, we thank you that you had a plan for this world, that we decided to step out and step off, and we as human beings have ruined everything. And yet, you had a plan even then to send your son to die for our sins, to show us what perfection looks like and to take the sacrifice that we each have earned and deserve. And you have given us this. Come into our bodies by your Holy Spirit and changed us and made us born again in our spirit. And we thank you for that, Lord. As we read your word, as we talk through all of this, I pray that you'd be with me and help me to deliver it in the way I should. And that you'd help each one of us, Lord, to have our hearts and our minds open, that we might learn from you as your spirit communes with each one of us. And Lord, we do come to the altar. We come to a place where we put everything out there and we give you ourselves. And I pray that you might be glorified today. Do that which is pleasing to you in us. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 All right. Getting back into the book of Genesis, we're, we're coming, coming upon one of my favorite passages, which is chapter 21. Um, so I'm getting excited to get to the birth of Isaac, which has been long prophesied that he would come. And uh, we've been watching what Abraham and his wife Sarah have been doing as they moved along. Today, we're going to look at uh, what seems to be a hiccup in the scriptures, this one chapter. And it may seem familiar to you, just to remind you where you are. Last week, we talked about the judgment that came on Sodom and how the Lord went and delivered Lot, his two daughters, his wife, and how they took them out before he showed judgment and poured down judgment on the city of Sodom. And it's interesting, uh, they were judged for a couple of different reasons. In, in Jeremiah, I believe it says that they were judged because they didn't show hospitality, or at least they didn't show proper hospitality. Um, but we, we understand what happened at Sodom and Gomorrah. Actually, we know that there were five cities there in the plain, uh, one of them being a small one, <laughs> which Lot retreats to. Just to remind you, the, the three angels previously in chapter 18 that were speaking with Abram or Abraham, one of them was not an angel. They appeared as men. One stayed behind and had a conversation with Abraham, and he goes, shall I not tell Abraham what I'm about to do? didn't know what that was about. And so he calls him Lord and he explains to him, I'm about to bring down punishment on Sodom because the level of their sin has reached a place where I have to do something. And so he does, which tells us something of the grace of God that he waits and he waits for the right time until everything that can be done has been done. And then he steps in. And so we see that the angels leave Abraham as he's talking with the Lord and they go into the city and they meet Lot, who's a big guy in the city. He's, he was an outsider and he's now an insider and he's actually part of the administration and government of the city. And he says, well, why don't you guys come into my house and let me take care of you? And, and they said, no, that's all right. We'll sleep here in the square. And he's like, oh, no, you won't because there'll be no sleeping. Trust me, it's not something you want to do. People in the city are not kind. And so he says, please come into my house. He begs them, basically drags them into his house. Before they get a chance to actually lay down, he feeds them and, and all. And then suddenly all of the men from the city surround the house, young and old from north, south, east, and west, from all four quarters. 
and they assault the house, and they said, send those men out so we might have relations with them. I, I won't explain to you what that means because we talked about it last time. And so they surround the house and they get violent and Lot goes out and he says, listen, let me talk to him. He goes out and tries to talk to him. And he says, listen, I've got two virgin daughters. I'll send them out. You can have them have your way with them, but don't, don't mess with these guys because they've come under the protection of my roof, which makes me say, I'm glad I'm not your daughter, Lot. <laughs> under the protection of your roof, you would think it'd be family first. <laughs> But he has been soaking in Sodom for so long that he's stained with the sin of Sodom. And suddenly his conscience is not what it should be. And so he proposes this idea, except it's not a good idea. And we understand that these things happen as an example so that we don't repeat them. Not everything in the scripture is there for us to emulate and say, yeah, let's do that. It also shows the sinfulness of our hearts and what can happen when we're not doing what's right before God. And we see that they struck them with blindness. The angels pull Lot back in because he's trying to have a conversation and he strikes them all with blindness. And even in their blindness, they're trying to find the door. They're still desperately trying and bent on this sin, this evil that they wanted to do, which tells me, you know, sometimes you can be in such a state that nothing will stop you from continuing to pursue, even though angels might blind you. And we've, we've all had a turn at groping around and trying to find what we want and not being able to find it. Amen? Amen? At least I have. And so he strikes them with blindness. He tries to get his sons-in-law, those who are engaged to his daughters, and get them out of the city, and they laugh at him. They don't believe a word he says. He says, get out. The Lord's going to destroy the city. And what a crazy message that sounds like, right? That's like telling people Jesus is coming again. Or that it's going to rain for 40 days and nights. It's the same. Telling people that which is unbelievable, which God does, is something that's not easily received. And so they laugh him, laugh him right out to scorn. And so they, the angels say, you got to get out of here. And, he's, and he lingers. He just kind of brain dead. He didn't throw it in drive. You know, the, the lights are on, but nobody's home. And the angels grab their hands, each one of them, and drag them out of that city forcefully, harpazo, if you would, forcefully remove them from the city so that they can do... And they say, get to the mountains because we can't do a thing until you get there. Because we know from the conversation with Abraham, even if there's 10 righteous people in that city, they won't destroy the city for the 10 righteous because God will not destroy the righteous with the wicked. So we learned that from the previous chapter. But he says, there's a town right down here. It's a, it's a little one. It's a little town. In fact, I'm going to call it little town. Can't we go there? And they're like, all right, all right, all right. Just go, just get, go. And as they go... God brings judgment upon it, and all of the five cities of the plain, they end up burning up, and it rains, it says, sulfur and fire, and that's a pretty crazy thing, and we, we know what ends up happening. They're running away for their lives, and they're seeing the judgment that's happening, and they're heading to this city. Well, it, it turns out that uh, all of the five cities were planned to be slated uh, for destruction, and yet Lot chose one that he wanted to go to because he was a city dweller and didn't want to go to the mountains. And he had serious fear in his heart about being torn up by animals, lions, tigers, and bears. And so the angels give a concession and say, sure, you can go. But then that city doesn't get destroyed. So they go to Zor. And of course, his wife, the famous thing about his wife is she turns around and she turns into a pillar of salt. Undoubtedly, the debris that was coming off of the explosions and everything that was happening. She looked back longingly. She didn't look over her shoulder to see if anything's following her. She stopped and looked longingly at the city, which tells me there are certain things you shouldn't look at in your past because they will be the destruction of you. Yeah. It's best to keep your eyes on the future, keep your eyes on the Lord, and keep your eyes away from the stuff behind you because, my goodness, the devil can tie us up in knots with the things that have been done. I know it's happened to me. I've done enough stuff that I watch the door and I look for people from my old life that might show up. And I think, boy, they would, they would tell you some stories. <laughs> and so here they are burning on the plain and judgment comes to these five cities. And he decides to get out of Zor, this little town that he's in. Doesn't tell you why but maybe he was afraid of judgment because he saw the judgment on all the others. And so he takes his daughters and they find a cave. They didn't go to the mountains like they were told. They go into a cave. 
Caves in the scripture are never where anything good happens. It's a place of hiding, hiding from responsibility, hiding from dealing with what you need to deal with, hiding from being obedient to where God's called them to be. And some crazy things happen there. They have this conversation, which is rather revealing. They say, there's no man on the face of the planet who will give us children. And apparently that was the most important thing to them. And so the older talks to the younger and says, let's get dad drunk and do disgusting things. And our father will father our children. And so the oldest one gets him drunk so he doesn't even know what's going on and gets impregnated. And so does the younger daughter get impregnated. This is so much worse than anything you see on Jerry Springer. The Bible. You need to be a certain age before you read these things. As it was in the days of Noah or in the days of Lot, it shall be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. There'll be a time in which the Lord comes and takes his people away before pouring out ultimate judgment on the rest of the world. And Jesus said this. He said, as it was in those days, and he mentions two times, the days of Noah, the days of Lot. When he took righteous Noah and his family, put him into an ark, and lifted him up away from judgment, which was water. And then we see in Sodom, it was fire. Took the righteous that were there, ended up only being three. Really, Lot was the only one there. I wouldn't consider his daughters righteous after what they did. And they become the mothers of these two nations. And they become the arch enemies of Israel. From then on, the offspring of Abraham, even though they're related. So today we're going to look at deja vu all over again. You know, you know deja vu is French. See, now you know French. It's, it's that feeling that you've been here before, that this has happened before. Maybe I had it in a dream. Maybe it was something weird. It's deja vu. I've been here before. It's a familiarity. It's something that you shouldn't be familiar with because it's new, but it seems like it's something old. That's not what Wikipedia says, I'm sure, but there it is. So here's a situation where Abraham is going to leave, and he's going to leave the promised land where God called him to, and he's going to go south towards Egypt. And that's always a picture of where not good things happen too. But picking it up in verse 1 in chapter 20, it says, And Abraham journeyed from there to the south and dwelt between Kadesh and Shur and stayed in Gerar. So Here's where he was. He was over here around Hebron, and he ends up booking it over here to Gerar, up on the seacoast of the Mediterranean. And here's, these are where all these cities were. Here's where Zor is. All these other cities that were burning were here. Um, so he leaves. And you would say, well, why is he leaving? Well, he's headed towards Egypt, and it's interesting. Um, don't know why he would be, but we do know somebody that headed in that direction, and they went to shore. Do you remember who it was? It was Hagar, Hagar and Ishmael. Remember, Hagar ran away, and that's the direction she went. She ended up hanging out in shore. So don't know why he's heading south towards Egypt, but he is. Perhaps Abraham wanted to change neighborhoods after the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. Maybe it was the incredible ash that was coming down everywhere. Um, don't know why he wanted to leave. He wanted a change of neighbors or neighborhood after what happened. Maybe he finally let go of Lot, his nephew. Maybe finally, because he's been dragging Lot with him, and the Lord told him, leave your family, leave your kin, leave everything. And he took his father and Lot, and then his father died and left him in Haran, and then they went on a little bit further. And sometimes we have trouble letting go of things, right? Yep. Maybe he finally let go of Lot. Maybe he trusted the angels that said they were going to go and deliver the righteous, and Abraham said, okay. It, it, finally, the umbilical's been cut, <laughs> and he's no longer going to be watching over Lot. And that's the end that we hear of him, by the way, uh, in the scriptures. Or possibly they went for lower taxes, which is why people leave New Jersey. So it very well could happen. Now, Abraham and Sarah, his wife, said to his wife, she's my sister. And Abimelech, king of Gerar, sent and took Sarah. Doesn't that sound familiar? He did the same thing 25 years previously when he went to Egypt. He goes into Egypt, which is a place you don't want to go because there's some really bad habits and bad lifestyle, and there's people, places, and things you should avoid. But he goes there anyway, and it turns out he has to lie. He lies, and they say, hey, who's the honey on your arm? Oh, that's my sister. 
He figured it would be better for him because if they found out that it was his wife, they have absolutely no problem with murder. And they just take your stuff, take your wife, and take everything, and it's all over. But, a, but you know, taking your sister, that, you know, they, they have some respect if it's your sister. I, I don't know why. That's just their set of morals. It's not yours or mine. But anyway, he comes down to Gerar, and now Abimelech, uh, Abimelech, it's Abby, Abby's father, and Melech means king. So he's, the, the king is my father. That's what his name means. And it's actually a position, uh, much like Pharaoh is. You don't care. But anyway, there it is. <laughs> so he goes to Gerar, and he says, listen, you remember that thing that I told you, pretend you're my sister? Just, just stick with that, that story. And that's the story we're going to tell all these people because I'm afraid they're going to kill me and take you. And I know you people would never lie under any circumstances. I'm sure when you take a sick day, you're really sick. I'm sure you never go over the speed limit. There's no deceit in any of your lives. But you see, he's, he's afraid, isn't he? And that's why people lie, because of fear. I'm afraid to tell the truth either because I don't think you can handle it or I think what you're going to say to me or think of me or do to me. And so you tell a lie because you're trying to alter people's consciousness. It's, uh, it's a thing that we do, and sometimes it's a learned response, and it's a survival thing, isn't it? He's doing it, what he thinks, is to survive because he's got this idea in his head. He's got this imagination that's gone wild. He says, you know, if they find out you're my wife, they're going to kill me and take all my stuff and take you, and that'll be the end of me. What facts does he have to base that on? Zero. Think about all the phobias that people have going out in public, speaking, public speaking, afraid of heights, afraid of clowns, afraid of germs, afraid of church. I mean, people have phobias, okay? How do you get these phobias? You fixate on something and you inflate it to be something that's really not. You watch one bad movie with a killer clown in it, and that's it. <laughs> Clowns are no longer fun. And that's how it happens. Now, he's never had this experience, but his imagination is filled in the blanks, and he's painted some scenario in his mind of what would happen. That's what we do. And you know what happens? You're in bondage. You're in bondage to your own imagination because you're afraid. This is a man of God, by the way. Habits are hard to change, not just bad habits, but good habits, and that's the nice thing. If you develop some good habits, it's really hard to change those too, right? That's why you want to do something to the point where it's a habit. Like, I don't even remember tying my shoes today. It's, there's no laces. Don't even bother looking. <laughs> but habits are hard to change, and that's one of the beautiful things about habits. If you get some good ones, they, they, they sink in deep. But we drag stuff with us from our childhood very often, from our upbringing, and we're afraid of things that we really shouldn't be afraid of, right? The root cause of why he does this is fear. I want you to lie. Now, how do you think God feels about that? And you don't seem very persuaded. Listen, the Ten Commandments, it's one of the big ten, right? Do not bear false witness. We call that lying. Just shortened it. Don't bear false witness. Don't say something that isn't true. And, you know, you can include sarcasm in that list. You can include um, exaggeration, emotionalism. You can, you know, anything that's just not completely true. And, you know, somebody comes to your garage sale and they say, yeah, yeah I'm interested in this thing. And you say, oh, yeah, it's in perfect condition. Just don't turn it over. <laughs> that's lying. You're afraid to tell the truth because maybe you won't sell that junk and you'll have to just throw it away. Fear. And it's interesting because Abimelech, the king of Gerar, sent to took Sarah. She took, he took Sarah. You know. Knock, knock, knock. Hi, how are you? Hey, Abimelech wants Sarah, your sister. He'd like to check her out, go out on a date. You don't mind, right? Come on, Sarah, let's go. I'm going to deliver you. How did that go? If you show up at my house, and even if I lied and said, my wife is my sister, which she is, because we have the same father, who's God, they don't get crazy. <laughs> Under what circumstances would I let her go? 
Are you kidding me? She's not available. Why, is she married to someone else? Uh, yes, but I can't tell you who. I'll tell you later. And then you run away and go back to the promised land where you belong. But now she's gone because of his lie. You know what it's like when you lie and somebody else suffers? You know how terrible that feels? Man, just, ugh. Anyway, so she's gone now. It's all over. But God, you want to look through the scriptures? There are some really good turns of story where God comes into the picture. But God came to Abimelech in a dream by night and said to him, indeed, you are a dead man because of the woman in whom you have taken. She is a man's wife. Can you imagine that? For him, it was probably like going and buying something at Target and going home. And then he went to bed and had a dream. You're a dead man because you bought that product. <laughs> what? It was on the shelf. I mean, you know, it was available and I had the money to pay for it. I mean, what did I do wrong? Right? Wouldn't you feel a little like, that seems a bit severe, God. I didn't know. You wouldn't feel that way probably, no. I would feel that way. I, I'd, I'd want to talk to God about that. So... She's another man's wife. Because when God tells you you're dead, you're dead. You're dead man walking. It's over. Now, he's got fear. This is a defense of marriage act. God takes action and defends the marriage when Abraham wouldn't stand up and do what he should. That's the defense of marriage act. It's an act that God did, not the thing you see in politics. I said I wasn't going to talk about that. Now, Abraham's done this before. He has this repetition. He's got this repeated failure with fear, right? You guys agree with me? You remember the, the passage? We went to, okay, good. I'm just wondering if you're here because I'm, I'm, I'm working here. I just want to know you're following me. What do you do when you find in your own character a flaw like that? When you realize, hey, I've blown it, you know, like you just got your eighth speeding ticket. Thank you, officer. Are you sure there's no, oh, okay, all right. You know, you throw it on the seat or whatever you have to do. You realize you have a repeated failure in a particular area. I don't know about you, but that's a hard thing to deal with. Oh, maybe not you good people, maybe just me. Now, Abraham should know better. The scripture says in Proverbs chapter 21, verse 1, the king's heart is in the hand of the Lord. Like rivers of water, he turns it wherever he wishes, which tells me we should pray for a president. We should pray for Putin. We should pray for the Ukraine. We should pray for people because God changes people's hearts. And when you can't change things, you can get all freaked out about it or you can pray about it because God changes things. So there's, there's fear. Fear is an interesting thing. It's quite often false evidence appearing real. False evidence appearing real, F-E-A-R. You guys are unimpressed. <laughs> or you don't agree? Maybe you understand this. Forget everything and run. Or face everything and rise. Fear is one of those things where uh, nobody wants to be afraid, but it happens to everybody. And it's not that you have it or you don't have it, it's what you do with it. Because very often courage is action in the face of fear. It doesn't mean the absence of fear. And so here we have a couple of people that are now faced with a choice. You have Abraham, who's God's pick, and he seems to be blowing it by making up lies again. Because he's afraid. Isaiah 43, uh, 1 to 3, if you've been watching The Chosen, you'll recognize this passage. But now, thus says the Lord who created you, O Jacob, and he who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by your name, and you are mine. If you have come to faith in Christ Jesus and to his sacrifice, and you are now a born-again believer, that is true of you that you're his, you're his. 
He says, you're mine. What are you going to be afraid of? What should you be afraid of? Well, everybody's afraid of something. So if you're going to be afraid of something, fear God. Or you can fear anything else. You will either have a fear of God or you will fear everything else. Something will fill that slot. Anyway. So he comes to him by night. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abraham in a vision saying, do not be afraid, Abraham. I am your shield and exceeding great reward. You remember that in chapter 15? Abraham didn't take it to heart. He said, I will be your shield. I'll take care of you. I'm going to be your great reward. And he does like we do sometimes. Uh-huh. Okay. We kind of half-heartedly acknowledge it. He should have remembered. Psalm 23, a very famous psalm. Right in the middle of it says, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. David, writing the psalm, is talking about God's shepherding of him because he's a sheep, and he understood what it would be a shepherd because he was a shepherd. So he writes Psalm 23, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. I have no lack of any good thing. He leads me beside still waters. He, you know, the whole thing. But here, right in the middle, he says, I will fear no evil. I go through the valley of the shadow of death. I mean, you know, ominous music and it's dark out and you're walking through this passage and there's, you know, lions and tigers and bears. I am not going to be afraid. You know, that's a decision that you make before you face it. It's not a reaction to something. It's a decision you make before you get there. I think people are just pushovers to fear. And I think I am too sometimes. And I think it's something we need to deal with. What if you weren't afraid? Interesting question. What would you do if you weren't afraid? Think of what it is. Are you afraid of clowns? What would you do if you weren't afraid? Are you afraid of heights? What would you do if you weren't afraid? It's amazing. Now, there's a lot of crazy things you can do if you have no fear. Fear is, a, you know, having a natural fear of, like, sticking your hand in a hungry lion's cage. That, that's wise. You know, not playing Frisbee on the parkway. That's a good idea. <laughs> there are good, healthy respects that we should have, but I wouldn't call those fears. Having a fear of God is the ultimate of what we should have. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2 talk about this repeated failure issue. Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, by the way, all of chapter 11 are these cloud of witnesses, all of by faith, by faith, by faith this one did, by faith that one did, by faith. So here's all this dissertation of all the faithful that have gone before. Let us lay aside every weight now, this is a principle of running. You don't want to be weighed down with weight, although the military does it, but it's for conditioning. Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising its shame, and he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. That's how we live our lives, not in fear, but in faith. The sin that so easily entangles us is a lack of faith. It's a lack of trusting in God. The whole previous chapter talked about faith, and then he goes, therefore, which you always look to see what it's there for. It's because all of those people, the sin that so easily entangles us is we don't believe God. Right? When I get worried about how I'm going to make ends meet, how am I going to pay this bill? I can't pay this bill. Oh, no, my car broke down. How am I going to fix that? I get worried about my house. Oh, no, we found termites. I get worried about this. I get worried about that. I worry about relationships, worried about... If I'm going to get all tied up in that fear, I do that because I don't believe that God's big enough to fix it. Or I don't believe that God loves me enough to intercede. It's a lack of faith. And that's the thing that's like some kind of a jump rope that you accidentally trip on and get tangled up in and makes you fall in your run is you don't believe what God said. The important thing is that you know what God said first 
because before you can believe it, you have to know he said it. So, and we keep our eyes on Jesus. You don't want to turn around like Lot's wife. You want to keep your eyes on Jesus. So, but Abimelech had not come near her. And he said, Lord, will you slay a righteous nation also? Also means you're comparing yourself to something else. Did he not say to me, she is my sister? And she, even she herself said, he is my brother. In the integrity of my heart and the innocence of my hands, I have done this. He says, God, why are you going to kill me? I didn't know. It's a, it's a good thing. But notice he says, will you slay a righteous, a righteous nation also? What's he referring to? Sodom. He knows what happened to Sodom. It wasn't that far away. And it was a giant catastrophe. And there were at least four cities that went down. Would you destroy a righteous nation as well? This guy who's a non-believer is a God-fearer. And he's now having a conversation with God. And Abraham, our hero, is a schlub and he's lying. <laughs> How horrible is it when an unbeliever is living a better life than a believer and they are reproof to him? Oh my goodness. So he's talking about Sodom. There's a, there's a whole bunch of mess here, but Abraham is lying. God is communicating very clearly with him, don't you think? He's not pulling any punches. And he's innocent and guilty at the same time. Did you know you can be guilty and innocent at the same time? Did you know that you can be sincerely deceived? There are a lot of people who are sincerely deceived. They think if they do enough good things, God will love me and I'll go to heaven. What book you been reading? It's not the Bible. What church do you go to? They probably don't teach the word of God because the word of God says there is absolutely no way I can be right with God except through accepting the free gift of Jesus Christ in my life. Amen? Amen. You can be sincerely deceived. You can be guilty and yet know, know you're guilty. So there's this deception about him being sincerely wrong. He is really wrong, but he doesn't know it. But now he does because God communicated it very clearly to him. God said to him in a dream, yes, I know that you did this in the integrity of your heart. For I also withheld you from sinning against me. Interesting. God withheld this man from consummating this relationship. You remember what he did with Pharaoh's household? The men suddenly had no libido. I'll explain it to you later. <laughs> I also withheld you from sinning against me. Therefore, I did not let you touch her. Now, therefore, restore the man's wife, for he is a prophet, a lying prophet, and he will pray for you and you shall live. But if you do not restore her, know that you shall surely die, you and all that are yours. That seems pretty serious. This is the first time prophet is mentioned in the Bible. First time of Abraham, the lying coward. Which tells me something. God gifts people apart from their worthiness. God gifts people apart from their worthiness. If I didn't know that, I wouldn't be able to do this job. It's interesting when you think you're doing something, there's God behind you making it happen. It's interesting. I'm the one who kept you from consummating this relationship. And he probably thought it was all about him. It's interesting, this unworthy prayer who is Abraham. He says, he's a prophet. He's my guy. He speaks for me. And by the way, you go tell him he's going to pray for you and you'll be okay. Everything's going to be fine in you and your household. But if you don't, you're done. You're a dead man. You mean you want me to ask the liar to pray for me? Doesn't that kind of disqualify him from talking to God? 
Do you ever feel disqualified as a Christian because you don't have a perfect life? Interesting. Does it change your salvation? It'll change your, it'll change your happiness quotient. It'll change your relationship with God. It'll change your intimacy with God. It'll change how you sense the blessings of God, but it will not change your position in Jesus Christ. That's why he says, he's a prophet. He's my guy. You ask him to pray, I'll listen to him and everything will be okay. But if not, you're a dead man. I would definitely do what I could to get on his good side. This is the death penalty. And this disobedience is going to affect his entire family. By the way, you know that your sin affects everybody around you? Your sin affects everybody around you. If I'm in sin, not only does it affect my relationship with God, it affects my relationship with all of you. And so, Abimelech rose early, because he didn't get much sleep, I bet, in the morning, and he called his servants, and he told all these things in their hearing. And the men were very much afraid, because if you can't reproduce, that's the end of your nation, and they were all going to die. And Abimelech called Abraham and said to him, what have you done to us? How have I offended you that you have brought on me and my kingdom a great sin? You have done deeds to me that ought not to be done. Then Abimelech said to Abraham, what did you have in view that you have done this thing? I, I could see saying that to him. What were you thinking? I, any of you who have children may have said that. What were you thinking? This is an unbeliever suffering from the falsehood of a believer. How shameful is that? I don't ever want to be like this guy. Accountability for influence. Listen, he's, he's calling him out for what he did, right to his face. By the way, that's, that's a pretty good idea. He might want to be a bit softer than Abimelech was, but he's calling to account. What were you thinking? And it's interesting because Abraham will tell him. You, you guys know the difference between shame and guilt, right? And what to do about all that so you don't drag stuff around, right? That's good. Well, I'll repeat it for anybody that might not know on, on the internet. Guilt is something we all experience when we do something wrong and we're made aware of it. It's good. If you don't feel guilt, there's something wrong with you. Shame is a stain on your soul that will never be washed off. It's attached to you like it's who you are. Some evil, horrible, terrible thing that you did defines you, and that's who you are, and you can never be forgiven for it, and you can never shake it. That's shame. Guilt, I hope you all have. Shame, I hope none of you have. Because Jesus Christ came and died for our sins so that we might be washed clean. And that's why Jesus is so important. Otherwise, we carry with us the shame of our sinful behavior in the past, and it defines us, and it ruins the future. Do you understand that? And I'm, I'm sure if we let you all one by one come up here and talk about your most hurtful moment or something that absolutely devastated you, I asked the ladies on Tuesday <laughs> what their greatest hurt was. They didn't clam up like a bunch of guys would have. They kind of opened up, which scared me. And then they started asking me to volunteer the answer to that question. You know what my greatest fear is? I'm not gonna tell me. I'm not gonna tell you, you're gonna use it against me. And it's not clowns. I'll, I have to tell you now, because I teased you. Failure. I am afraid of failure. And there are things that have happened in my past where I've failed miserably, and I don't ever want to do that again. And that's, that's something that uh, I have to balance with grace and not taking the shame, because the devil will whisper in your ear and tell you all the horrible things that you are because of what you've done. Right. But it's not who I am. Right. It's what I did. And you have to be able to separate the incident from the person, and only Jesus can do that. 
So that's shame versus guilt. The interesting thing is, if, if you have guilt, there's a nice way to deal with it. If you've done something wrong, now this is what I would have coached Abraham to do. Tell him you did wrong. Confess. I was, I was wrong. I was wrong. I never should have lied. It's wrong. I realized God doesn't want me to do it. I did it out of fear. I was wrong. I never should have done that. Number two, I'm sorry. Which, that's the piece that most people understand, and that's usually all that happens. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Okay, it's all over. It'll happen again. I'm sorry is contrition. When you are broken about what you did. When it hurts you to the place where you say, I don't ever want to do this again. You have to have some kind of an emotional stock in this thing. If you don't, you'll probably do it again. I'm sorry. I feel sorrow. I have a great weight upon my chest because of what I've done. Number three, please forgive me. Very often in restoration, we forget this stage. Please forgive me. Why? Because they got something against you, like a rock. And boy, they're going to hold on to that and remind you of it every single day. You remember when you did this thing? You remember this? Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. I, that's who you are. No, that's called shame. And so you ask for forgiveness. Can you forgive me? In other words, will you take this rock and drop it and never throw it, and never bring it up, and never remember it? never repeat it. That's what you're asking somebody to do. And isn't that what you want somebody to do that has something against you? Well, I know I do. And number four, I repent. I will never do that again. By the way, that's the package. And if there's restoration that's needed, if you stole something, or you damage something of somebody's, you need to restore that. And that's, another, that's a whole other story. But it seems reasonable, doesn't it? it? Seems biblical. Confession, contrition, remission, and repentance. I'm sure you'll remember them. You'll get them tattooed on your wrist and you won't forget them. In Proverbs chapter 13, verses 14 and 15, it says, The law of the wise is a fountain of life to turn one away from the snares of death. Good understanding gains favor, but the way of the unfaithful is hard. You realize Abraham is now suffering for something he did. The way of the unfaithful is hard. When we blow it and we think we're going to get away with it, we never do because God loves us and he's a good father. And so the way of the unfaithful is hard. It's hard. It's much better to just do what he wants you to do, right? And Abraham said, now he's going to answer him. He says, what were you thinking? Why did you do this? You brought this all down on me. And what does Abraham say in response? Because I thought, surely the fear of God is not in this place. And you were wrong. And they will kill me on account of my wife. And he was wrong. But indeed, she is truly my sister. Now he's making an excuse. She's the daughter of my father, but not the daughter of my mother. And, and she became my wife. And it came to pass when God caused me to wander from my father's house that I said to her, this is your kindness that you should do for me in every place, wherever we go, say of me, he is my brother. I'm not sure Abraham understood what, Ab what Abimelech was looking for. <laughs> Why did you do this? Well, let me see, where did it start? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Let me tell you the story of how it started. I don't think he cares about the story. Do you realize what you did? Why, why do you not have any remorse? Why is there no repentance? Why is there no offer of restoration? Why is there... Where's Abraham's head? He's supposed to be the hero of the story. He's the hero of the Bible, right? He's the, he's the father of all the faithful, and he's the father of all the Jewish nation. He's just not getting it. He's a lot like me. He's a lot like you when we don't get it. I think these things are in there because God wanted us to see that everybody's pretty much the same. Sometimes we just don't get it. And so Abraham gives his big, long story. This was, this was the first place he went wrong. Abraham said, because I thought. That's where it starts, isn't it? 
Because I thought. Who told you to do that? Because I thought. That's what happened, because I thought. Yet, guys, if you can nip it there, it'll never take, never take root in your heart. When the thought comes in, this is a godless people, and they're probably going to kill me and take my wife and all my stuff. Hold it. Who told you that? What evidence do you have to prove that? Well, I just know. Oh, yeah? How do you know? Well, I just do. <laughs> so why not just stick your head in a toilet and lock yourself in there? I mean, that's what you're doing. Because we become slaves to our imagination and the things that we let our mind do, right? Yes. Yes. So don't do that. Anyway, he thought. The scripture says things about that. He's got this fear of unbelievers, right? Proverbs 3, 5 to 8 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding, he thought. In all your ways acknowledge him and he shall direct your paths. Do not be wise in your own eyes. We call that being conceited. Fear the Lord and depart from evil and he will be health to your flesh and strength to your bones. Amen? Amen. Don't lean on your own understanding. Because sometimes we program our minds to think what we want it to think instead of believing the truth. It's that sin that so easily entangles us. Where is his fear of God? God is nowhere in his explanation other than God caused me to leave. Was he going to try to turn us into a witnessing opportunity in the middle of his being a, a, a liar? What's God got to do with it? He doesn't bring God into it except God made me wander. And he told me, go to a place that I'll show you. And then he didn't show me anything. And I just had to, to put one foot in front of the other and trust he was going to lead me. And I mean, how was I? It sounds like God's getting a little shade there. He's getting guilted a little into that. He's got a worst case scenario all built up in his mind, right? Did you ever do that? Oh, no. Pastor Dave wants to talk to me in his office. <laughs> I don't know what I did. I must have done something. Maybe you found out about something I did. Maybe, maybe my wife's been talking. That's it. My wife was talking to him. <laughs> and you get a whole scenario, and I call you into the office, and I just uh, wanted you to pray with me because I'm struggling with something. And you go, oh, oh, good. Yeah, yeah, I'll do that. Yeah. <laughs> you know how you can build something up in your mind to be something that it's not? We are such broken people, are we not? God help us. Fear is one of those things that is a terrible master. So he's got this worst case scenario built up in his mind. Now, when he talks about his wife being his sister, it's only a half lie. So he's trying to justify the lie by saying it was kind of half true. That's like, this thing's in perfect condition, just don't turn it over and look at the bottom of it. <laughs> He's trying to say, well, I told you some of the truth because she's, she's really like my stepsister and so she's kind of... Like, do you think Abimelech cares? No. Abimelech doesn't care. <laughs> he doesn't care. So what does God have to do with it? He's trying to turn us into an opportunity to witness and this sounds like a full confession, doesn't it? Do you think this is an explanation or an excuse? I'll tell you what it's not. It's not a confession. So, do you see it missing? I was wrong. Takes no responsibility. Number two, I'm sorry. Not an ounce of compassion. Hey, Abimelech, I'm really sorry I did this to you, man. I understand what it... I, I'm really sorry I'm an outsider. I came into your space and like, I should have been clear. No. Nothing. If you apologize like this, it's not going to go well with you. You might insulate yourself from feeling bad, but you're supposed to feel bad. You're supposed to feel bad when you do things that are wrong, right? And so feel it. Deal with it. And get the heck out of it. Go through it. Don't go around it. Don't put it in a bottle. Throw it in your bar. Because, you know, that thing gets full and it starts overflowing. Don't sweep it under the rug because pretty soon all you got is a big mound in the middle of the room. Deal with it. Go through it. Process it. Confession. Contrition. Please forgive me. No. 
Never again will I do this and repent. He didn't do that. Notice, none of those things are in here. Guess what? I screwed up too. I don't take full responsibility. Sometimes I don't feel what I should feel. I don't think what I should think. I don't say what I should say. And unfortunately, I see Abraham falls into this. And yet God chose him and he's a prophet and he's his kid. It's one of his black sheep right now, but it's one of his kids. And that's who you are. If you know the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior, he's one, you're one of his kids. If not, you need to rectify that. And then Abimelech, I love this. He took sheep, oxen, male and female servants and gave them to Abraham. Kind of a parting gift. And he restored Sarah, his wife, to him. And Abimelech said, see, my land is before you. Dwell where it pleases you. So he's given him free real estate. Then to Sarah, he said, behold, I have given your brother a thousand pieces of silver. Indeed, this vindicates you before all who are with you and before everybody. Thus, she was rebuked. So you gave Abraham a thousand pieces of silver and gave him all this stuff and I'm rebuked? How does that work? I want you to notice something. It's so important to read carefully. And to Sarah, he said, behold, I have given your brother. I thought we got that all straightened out. But he says, yeah, I gave your brother. You see the sarcasm? Sarcasm is not just on this podium, okay? <laughs> I gave to your brother. Well, you know, he's not treating her like a wife either, so it's hardly a worthy thing to call him a husband because he's not guarding his wife like he should. Anyway, I'm sorry. I see these things and I think, am I the only one to see this? And then I show you and then you're like, oh, no, I didn't see that. Good. So he takes corrective measures and he's blessing Abraham as he goes because he's a prophet and he wants him to pray for him and he wants to go back to, you know, making babies and this whole nation to do that. Rewarded for deception. You remember this happened last time? He ended up getting Hagar as a consolation prize too, which ended up tripping him up. So not such a great thing. But there's this conf confrontation and correction for everybody. So not just was Abraham held accountable for what he did, but so was Sarah because Sarah also lied and was complicit. So everybody bears responsibility. The problem is we used to take responsibility on ourselves that we shouldn't take. And we divest ourselves of responsibility that we should take. But here, everybody has a piece of the pie. Everybody's taking their thing. Hebrews 12, chapter 11 says, no chastening seems good, <laughs> seems to be joyful for the present, but painful. <laughs> Nevertheless, afterwards, it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Do you understand when we get rebuked because we do something wrong, we get corrected, we get shown, hey, this is wrong. When you're trained by that and you go through the process, you make a right confession, you admit that you were wrong, you're hurt, I'm sorry, uh, you're contrite, you go into please forgive me. You're, you're going to ask for them to remit your sins and not, not hold the rock against you and not bring it up again and not mention it to anybody else. And you repent and you say, I'm never going to do this again. I'm never. I'm going to make sure I take steps that will never happen again. What more could you possibly want from someone? That's how you restore relationships. You don't just sweep it under the rug or forget about it or go, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. What you're saying is, I feel better now that I yelled and screamed and called you awful things and uh, I'm out of energy. I don't want to fight anymore. Yeah, me too. Okay, we'll be friends. <laughs> Until the subject comes up again. <laughs> we were on a break or something. <laughs> it will come up again. You need to deal with it. Oh. So Abraham prayed to God. This is, the, this is the happy ending. So Abraham prayed to God and God healed Abimelech, his wife and his female servants. So this affected everyone. And they bore children. For the Lord had closed up all the wombs of the house of Abimelech because of Sarah, Abraham's wife. What Abraham did not do as a husband that he should have done, God had to step in and do for him and protected his wife. 
against physical assault, consummation of uh, uh, adultery, if you will, and offspring, which have then been in question, which means the promise given to Abraham, it would have been a question as to whether it was Abimelech's kid. And if you know the whole story, as you go all the way to down, the highlight of all history is the birth of Jesus Christ. And it would have messed all that up. So that's why God was very involved, to protect our salvation. So Romans 12, 29 says, for the gifts and calling of God are irrevocable. The gifts and calling of God are irrevocable. Has he chosen you? Has he given you a gift? Are you his? Are you saved? Well, that's a done deal. You, you could mess up all sorts of things, but you won't mess that up. Because the gifts and calling of God are irrevocable. You can run, you can hide, you, you can deny, but the gifts and calling of God are irrevocable. Abraham is still Abraham. Abraham is still God's kid, even though he screws up. And when he prays to God, God answers. On the basis of his perfection? No. On the basis of his character. And aren't you glad for that? Amen. So, when you can't preach, pray. You know, sometimes we have blown our relationship with people so badly that we can't speak to them. Because we have done things that they just can't forgive us for. There are people like this. I'm just informing you. I'm telling you from personal experience, there are people who will just never forgive you no matter how many times you go through those steps. And maybe you'll never be able to speak to them and give them a witness. It might be a family member. It might be a close friend. There might be somebody you just can't preach to because all they see is your failures and they don't hear you. But you can pray for them. You can pray for them. And God can reach in where you can't where maybe you have disqualified yourself in the past, God can reach in. Amen? Amen? This gives me hope for praying for people. In Psalm 143.8 says, Cause me to hear your loving kindness in the morning, for in you do I trust. Cause me to know the way in which I should walk, for I lift up my soul to you. Amen. That is a good prayer right there. Cause me to hear your loving kindness. Do you need to be reminded that God loves you yes. even though you mess things up? Yes. Everyone needs that. When David penned this, he needed it. Cause me to hear your loving kindness in the morning. Get off to a good start. For in you do I trust. Cause me to know the way in which I should walk. For I lift up my soul to you. Amen. I would challenge you, Psalm 143.8, Make that a prayer. Make that a morning prayer. Make it a daily thing where you can remember this verse and you ask God to show you his loving kindness and lead you in the way that you should walk, and he will do that. Amen? Amen. Okay. So, I wonder, is there some besetting sin in your life that needs to be shed before God blesses you? The reason I say that is because chapter 20 comes just before chapter 21. <laughs> and chapter 21 is the birth of Isaac. I think God allowed him to go through this, to deal with this issue for once and for done, to learn it, so that when he has a kid, he won't hand it off, that fear. I think God put this in here. It looks like a hiccup as we go through. We go, what? And then and we're back on the story. But because I think sometimes God has to purge us of things before he can put us into a place of prominence and fruitfulness in ministry. So what's, what's the thing that's tangling you? What point of faith don't you understand? What is it that you stumble in on a regular basis like he does? I mean, we only see two instances 25 years apart from each other. But he says, every place we go do this, which tells me there's probably a whole lot more going on. Is there something that needs to be shed before God blesses you to a greater degree? And if so... You can get on that, and you know we have a Savior who will deliver us. Amen. What would happen if you actually shed your fears and actually dealt with them and looked them square in the eye and trusted God with those things? What would you do? How would that change your life? I like to consider these things in the office at 1 o'clock in the morning, and I write them out. 
Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Therefore, since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, all those who have gone before us, let us lay aside every weight and the sin that so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. We have a wonderful example in Jesus Christ as to how to be able to handle things like that. You face it, and you face it with faith, and you shed the fear, do what God's called you to do in the face of fear, be obedient to do that which God's called you to do. And it's not an easy life, but that is the Christian life. Amen? Amen. So, next week, I already told you, it's the birth of Isaac. Finally, this, this prophecy that's been given that this old man's going to have a child, he's now over 100 years old, and his wife is 90. Hello? That's a long time to wait. It's been 25 years from the time that the Lord initially said he's going to raise him up to have. He says, if you could count the sand on the seashore, you'll be able to count your uh, offspring. Gave him a new name, Abraham. Gave him a little in there. Which means he's going to be the father of many nations. That's what his name means, Abraham. And so we're going to get to see finally the culmination of this and, uh, and what God does after that. I'm going to ask the worship team to come up. I hope you guys are enjoying the word as we go through it. And it's uh, that the Lord is speaking to your heart. These are things that we all go through, and I'm so grateful for the scriptures and that. It doesn't tell us about things that are lofty and high up and so beyond our understanding. Because I, I, can, I can relate to somebody like Abraham. Amen? Just don't do the things that he did. <laughs>